hello and welcome to today's Better Moments webinar. Let me admit the last few people that are in the waiting room. There we go. So my name is Laura Graff and I'm the Marketing and Communications Manager of Better Moments. I'm excited that so many people could join us again today. Also from the other side of the globe as we're hosting this webinar a bit earlier than usual. I do see some familiar names, but of course, there are always a few new people. So it would be great if you could use the chat tool to just share your name and location so that we can see where all of you are joining from tonight or today, actually. Um, you're also welcome. No, it is tonight. <laughs> Pardon? I said it is tonight. <laughs> yeah, it is tonight where you are. It's uh, bright and sunny where I am. <laughs> Um, yeah, anyways, you're allowed to uh, use the chat tool throughout the webinar to ask your questions and we will address them later after Peter's presentation in our little Q&A session. So, as you all know, today's lecture will be presented by Australian photographer Peter Eastway, who some of you may have already met on our Better Moments Iceland workshop. And Peter will also host our next Iceland workshop this September because Iceland is actually opening its borders this month. And um, the workshop we will be doing together will be in cooperation with Phase One. So every participant will be equipped with Phase One equipment worth $60,000. And also to celebrate that Iceland is opening its borders, we have a special offer that everybody can get a free update to a single room. And we will also host a city tour in Reykjavik with Peter Eastway and Better Moments founder, Christian Nörger. So, Today's topic is photography in the land of fire and ice, because despite its name, Iceland is not just icy, it can also be quite fiery. And it for sure is breathtaking. So I'm sure Peter has some beautiful and magnificent photos to share with us tonight. So I suggest you all get comfortable and get ready for our virtual journey to one of Europe's most spectacular countries. Peter, whenever you're ready. That's over to me, is it? Okay, yes. well, fine. thanks Laura. So welcome, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming along. And uh, um, I always think back to um, when I was growing up and my, uh, my uncle would uh, come out with the slide projector and the photos that he had uh, taken while he was overseas. And it would seem to take an interminably long period of time while we would watch, you know, here he was standing in front of the Eiffel Tower and here, here he was standing in front of the Eiffel Tower a little bit further to the left and a little bit further to the right. And but yeah, but you guys have all signed up for a slideshow. So I just think that maybe times have changed. I'll, I'll try not to have too many selfies in there. Now, it's very important that you laugh at my jokes. If you don't laugh at my jokes, I, I get offended and I get home. So I, I need to see a few little chats in there saying, Peter, your, your jokes are fantastic and you're getting better and better with age because that's, that's what I try to do. So I'm going to try and share a screen um, and I've got that here. So I think that's the one and that's, I'll just see whether I can move that around. Here we go. So I've got a few little notes for myself. So photographing Iceland. So I can't pronounce any of the names. So I'm sorry about that. Um, I also a big believer in that uh, a lot of the best photos are in between the big locations. But we'll, we'll get onto that. Take an ND filter. I'll talk a little bit about that. When we're there, we're going to talk a little bit about capturing the pixels because when you go to a location, for me, you know, photography is always about capture and post-production. So I'm just capturing my pixels there and then when I get back or maybe while I'm over there, there's an opportunity to get into the post-production. So I'm shooting with post-production in mind, um, but you know, people ask me, when I take the photo, do I know what it's going to look like at the end? And the answer is yes, no, and sometimes. And so that's my little cue to with me into the next section. So you're going to see my face again. There you go. I suppose that's good. And I'm just going to go and bring up a uh, bridge. And that's got my photos in it. Share. There we go. And go to view. Slideshow. Okay. So starting a little bit soon. So I guess what, I'm, what I've got essentially is just a series of photos which I took on the last uh, adventure which was last year which I did with Christian and we had a, a great time with uh, I think there are 10, 10 other photographers with us at the on, on that occasion everybody had the opportunity to use a phase one camera but that's not essential a lot of people they use the phase one camera sometimes and then they use their Nikon Canon Fuji whatever it is and other times it's not essential so phase one is it's there as an offer if you'd like to obviously I shot mainly on phase one and um, I'm certainly a, a, a 
a medium format um, convert, you might say. So the, the, whether you're shooting on medium format or not, Iceland is an amazing place. This is the Church of Budia, the Black Church, which has become very, very famous. And most trips to Iceland aim to go there. If Iceland, if you think of Reykjavik, which is a capital, which is sort of down in the south in the middle, and you can go up to the left and to the west, and that's where the church is. But a lot of the big waterfalls and a lot of the places where people go to is actually up and over to the right. And so if you're going to do a, boy, a trip to uh, Iceland, you probably want to do more than four or five days so that you can see both sides. And then if you actually want to go all the way around Iceland, then you probably need three or four weeks, I would suggest to do it properly. You can do it in a lot less, but you know, you've got to allow for weather and all sorts of stuff. Oh, did I talk to you about the weather? That can be exciting. So just um, near the church from Budia is a little place, again, I can't pronounce the name, I'm not trying to be secretive, but it's, uh, Budia is probably pronounced incorrectly as well, but it's spelt that way. This place is Zakia for the or something like that. And it's on the coast and it's, I think it's a little bit further to the west, I'm, I'm going back on memory. And I can remember seeing this little house in a National Geographic magazine, oh, I, I'm guessing 20, maybe 30 years ago now. I'm going to get into big trouble if someone says that this house was only built five years ago, but I'm pretty sure it was 20 or 30 years ago. Now, I just remember this volcano behind and the water in the foreground. And the first time I visited um, Iceland, I, I, I found this little house and I thought, what a great photograph. But it wasn't until I'd been walking around for a little while that all of a sudden I realised this is where that amazing photograph was taken. And I find that people often ask, you know, where do you get your ideas? when it comes to photography. And I think for, for all of us, it's not just a matter of having a camera and going to an amazing location. I mean, that certainly helps, but it's having a camera, going to an amazing location and having some ideas and some background, some insight into what makes a good photograph for you. What I like might be what you like, and that's quite okay. The only person we can really make happy with our photographs is ourselves. But what I guess, uh, is what I encourage people to do is to look at the work of other photographers, painters, or take inspiration from films, from movies, from you know, wherever, you know, books, whatever. But that inspiration is what makes you happy. And it can also in inform you about what you want to take photographs of. So yes, I had seen this little building in a National Geographic magazine years and years ago. I didn't want to make a copy of that photograph because another photographer had already done that. What I wanted to do was to take a shot that was my own. Uh, this, this was shot with a, a, the phase one and using a new feature on the phase one, which just sort of um, means you don't need to use a neutral density filter. You'll see that the water is all very blurred. That's because it was around about a, a one minute exposure. But it wasn't a one minute exposure like I would do a, a neutral density filter, which is the old way I used to do it and, and you still can. It was using a process called exposure averaging. So, the exposure was probably a 1 1 25th of a second or something like that, but it just kept on taking that shot 1 1 25th of a second continuously for half a minute, two minutes, however long I left it open. And that creates the same blur effect that you might get had you used a neutral density filter. And so I was quite, quite enamored with uh, the way, I, I mean, I, I love the way that we can use a little bit of time in our exposure just by blurring the clouds. You see that the clouds are a little bit blurred up on the top there, they've just moved a bit sort of indicating to me that maybe this was a, a 30 second exposure. But you can never tell. I mean, in Iceland, it's very unusual to have slowly moving clouds. Normally they're moving around at a million miles an hour. This is a view from where I was, but looking out the other way. And Iceland is punctuated with lots of little hamlets, little farms, and also little churches, which I, I love, I love to photograph. And when you go to Iceland, you sort of think sometimes of the big waterfalls that you know, the, the famous photos that everybody's taken. But for me, there's just so much along the road that a road trip through, uh, through Iceland is just absolutely sensational. We're back to the same sort of location, looking out the sea, like these wonderful little stacks, again, a long exposure. So uh, it's probably, a, I'm guessing, a two minute exposure because I did a few longer ones that day. Um, the reason that I'm guessing a little bit is because the software that I was using at the time with the phase camera didn't tell me what my exposure was. Um, or possibly I was overwriting where it was all written in the EXIF data. So I'm just guessing that these days I'll be, uh, I'll be able to tell you better if you need to know the exact details. But around two minutes, I'm guessing. One of the little churches we, well, 
well, I should rephrase that. One of the places we stayed at over there, this is on the Snake Helena's Peninsula, completely incorrectly pronounced, of course, but the peninsula up on the west, um, and it's a little place called Helnar. And this was my third or fourth visit to this particular location. I photographed this church every time. I absolutely love the church. It's getting a little bit older. You can see here on the left that uh, some of the windows have been boarded up with corrugated iron because um, I'm figuring that the restoration project isn't doing particularly well over there and uh, there's not, not an awful lot of uh, cash to, to renovate. And there is a church on every corner over in Iceland, so it's, um, it, 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 there's a, yeah, a lot of people wanting the money, I guess. But I, I digress. I've sp been there three or four times before, but I'd never been down to the beach at the base of the hotel. So behind the church, we can't see, but just down behind the hill there, there's the hotel that we stay. And then down below, there's these views with this wonderful beach and, and this particular view here, which you know, to me was perhaps one of, one of my favorite shots from that particular trip. I, I know, I just, I, I love the coast side. I, I live on the coast in Sydney and uh, funny, I hardly photograph it at all here, but I guess that's because things that become familiar be, lose interest to some extent. Whereas this uh, landscape I just found sensational. And we photographed it a couple of times. This is at a higher tide early in the morning. Just the shape of the, uh, the rocks. It's almost like they're, they're waves, which is obviously a result from the volcanic activity. I say obviously, uh, I'm no geologist, so maybe I'm completely wrong, but that's what it looked like to me. Another photograph, a lot long exposure. Um, and, uh, sometimes the itineraries that we run through um, in Iceland are because the distances are reasonable um, to get from the left hand side of Iceland to the right hand side we normally need to pick a couple of spots in between and again a ram foss or something like that I, I forget the name um, but this is a, a series of waterfalls that come down and it's an interesting little location it's sort of halfway between where we were and where we're going so um, some, at the time of year that we're at, there's another place called Land Manaligur, and I've pronounced that incorrectly as well, which is fantastic, and that's inland a little bit, but when we were there last time, it was a little bit late in the season, and access wasn't allowed. So season is important. Um, if you go in the middle of the year, or the middle of summer, which is sort of like July, um, I guess that's uh, getting up to around about now, and the 22nd of June is coming up, the sun is just gonna go around in circles, and you don't get great light. Whereas if you go in the shoulder seasons, in autumn and spring, then you get lots of sunsets and sunrises. The twilight lasts for quite a long time. I haven't actually been in winter, but that is one of the times I'd like to go, where we get everywhere. Um, yeah, all of the, I, the waterfalls are completely covered in snow. So that's on a little to-do list. Um, maybe, maybe not this year, but in a year to come, we'll, we'll get there in winter. So again, along exposure, another similar shot taken the same location. On the way, we, did, we took a little side road and we just went past the little lake, which was frozen. These are little rocks which are just tucked up, just sitting on top of the ice. And again, I've used a long exposure just to blur the clouds. Uh, that's probably a, a two minute exposure again. <clears throat> I normally find that 30 seconds to four minutes is normally about the ideal time. But again, depending on how fast the, uh, the clouds are moving, and also how wide your lens is. So if you're using a telephoto lens, you can imagine if the this is with quite a wide lens. If I was using a telephoto, I might be just covering the, inter the, the central section there and the clouds would move right across the frame. And so then maybe it's just a blur and it, it doesn't, have, um, doesn't have as much impact. I think that there can be too much blur just as easily as there can be not enough. So this is one of, another of my favorite shots. So just being a, an Australian from a basically warm country to be in another location where it's cold and there's snow and there's ice is yeah, always exciting for us. So Golfoss, which is a, uh, one of the, the famous places, if you go to Iceland for 24 hours, they, they do the golden circle, I think it is. They take you to the blue pool, they take you to the geyser, and they take you to the Golfoss. On, on this occasion, there's quite a lot of snow still uh, around and or, or early snows, I guess, because we're there September, I think, September, October. So it was early snows that were there and uh, not absolutely everywhere. This is a shot looking down with a telephoto lens. Uh, this is looking through the, I guess, the, the water that plumes off so that when we come back, you'll see as that water is 
landing down, it then just erupts back up. And so even on a beautiful, bright, sunny day, you find there's always this wonderful mist. And if you position your camera, you can shoot through the mist and into the, the chasm down below. This is shot up the top. Uh, I've got a, uh, again, a long exposure. I've got a telephoto lens. So I have, it's very important that you keep the camera completely still during this exposure. Otherwise, you know, when you enlarge that area up, you can end up with a little bit of blur. So that's a log covered in ice and it's wedged in there. When you enlarge it right up, or just on the left hand, or left and the right hand edges, the log is moving just fractionally. There is a, a little bit of blur, but it, that's in the middle, it's not moving at all and it is tack tack sharp. So a good quality tripod is useful. When it really blows, when it's really windy, it doesn't matter how good your tripod is, it's impossible to take long, long exposures like this. Um, when you're on the road, you can possibly position a tripod behind the van or the car as a windbreak, and that's one way to work it. Um, so it's always a, an interesting combination of taking the photograph that you want to take and what the weather will allow you to take. Another view, telephoto lens. People think about um, landscape photography as being a wide angle lens, but I have to say that I probably use a telephoto lens more than a wide angle. This is shot using a 240 millimeter Schneider, as was the previous shot, which is the equivalent of a 150 millimeter lens on a full frame DSLR. And I, I guess I love the, 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 the contrast of all of the icicles in the background there, which is on, the, on, on a distant wall. It's also thrown out of focus a little bit, and then just the sharpness down here where the, the falls and, and Gulfos has got three or four steps in them, and this is the first of the, the steps. And it's easy to get to. You basically drive up into a car park and then you wander along a boardwalk and then this is presented to you. Almost makes it a little bit too easy, doesn't it? I should have told you I spent five days camping out in the snow to get this shot, but um, it's not quite the truth. So another version of the uh, previous shot. You can also, uh, well, earlier shot, you can see here that my choice of colour balance um, can change the look of the photograph as well. It does have some little greens, you know, greens and yellows in it. The water was also a little bit muddy on this particular day, so quite a little bit of yellow, whereas I quite like the blue look, so that was why I changed the colour balance to, you know, to give it what I feel it should look like. I get into trouble with that for some people. So as we're moving along up the coast, again, another very uh, famous location. You can see up in the corner the, the stacks of Vic. Um, it's uh, overcast, moody, and a lot of people say, oh, geez, the weather's no good. And yet I think this weather, to go to Iceland and have seven days of beautiful, clear, sunny weather would just be the pits for me because it would just, you know, I just think it would be boring. To get these sort of days is what it's all about, where, you know, that, that rain squall that's going through, it's hiding the headland in the background and that creates a sense of mystery about it. And I, I, I just love that side of things. I think it, it's fantastic. So aerials, uh, yes. So you'll find that when we talk about going to Iceland that the aerials is a, an, an added extra. The reason that we do that is because there's no guarantee that when we're there, the weather is going to allow us to get up into the sky. And so I've been there several times and several times I've been unable to go. Other times I've been lucky. This last trip, we, we basically had poor weather and then there's this little window in the middle of our trip where the weather is sunnied up and it was great and you know, all our team got to fly. Uh, it's not a cheap exercise, but I think you'll agree when you see some of the photos uh, that uh, it, it just, just blows me away. The texture, etc. this might look a little bit blurry when you enlarge it up. You can see every little um, strand of grass and moss, etc. in there. And that's what I love about the Icelandic landscape is that you know, it's, it, the, uh, the, the land does have this softness from the air and it's hard to explain because, you know, it really is very harsh. And yet when you get this mantle of lichen and moss over the top, it just softens it down. Um, patterns, are, you know, again, just looking for the light. Um, can't tell you exactly where we took off from the land because I can't pronounce the places, but it's not too far away from, uh, well, actually it's probably a couple of hours on from Vic. Uh, so that's a little bit further around and up to the east. And there's a delta and a couple of other um, nice uh, waterfalls in the background. But we get to fly over some varying landscape. 
uh, there's some glaciers behind, which we'll get onto in a little while as well. So this is just in the, uh, as we get into the glaciers, one of the pools, uh, which at the time of year, well, we were there September, October, and it was an early, there was an early frost, I guess, and so a lot of the water had frozen, but you know, every season can be a little bit different. Uh, but you know, I, I, I love the fact that the, you know, it was ice in the, in the water there, just sort of, you know, I don't know, just like building blocks. Maybe I've got a, a Lego fix or something like that. And this is the glacier. It's funny, when, I, um, when I've been over the glacier before in poor light, and when we went up in the, uh, the plane for this flight, I was quite happy to concentrate over the delta where there were all these wonderful patterns um, of the water, of the rivers as they sort of you know, merge and dissect and merge again, etc. And I wasn't super keen to go over the uh, glacier because I didn't think there was going to be much in it. Because when I'd been over the glacier before in poor light, it was, it was, I was nonplussed, it wasn't fantastic. And then when we went over and the sun came out a little bit, and this is the sort of stuff that I'm seeing, and my eyes just got completely open. So again, if you've been to an, um, a location once, don't think that you understand it or know it, because uh, I, that's why I love going back to locations multiple times, is because the weather, the time of year, uh, just where, you, just the particular locations you go to can be completely different. And, uh, you know, very, very exciting, this, this particular uh, flight. So I love shots where it's just detail and pattern. But when you look at detail and pattern, it makes a great screensaver, but maybe there's not enough in it, you know. It's also a great photo in it as part of a book or as part of an audio visual, but it perhaps isn't a standalone shot and it doesn't give you much understanding. Whereas a photo like this, which is a little bit more, I guess, legitimate in that you can see what it is, uh, it gives you a bit more of an understanding of what the landscape is really like. And you know, just jumping in uh, a helicopter, did I say plane before? I think I did. First flights we did was in a plane, this time we were in a helicopter. Uh, it, it just, yeah, it's just sensational looking down, the shapes and the patterns. I, I find that if you're processing your files that the use of clarity, uh, or maybe even a little bit of dehaze if it's in Lightroom, uh, but clarity and dehaze just on the, uh, on the textures of the, uh, the glaciers and, and even the earth, uh, it's just fantastic. It just gives you a, just really brings out that texture. A little bit when you're photographing animals like you know, polar bears and penguins and things like that, uh, a little bit of clarity can really bring out the texture in the, the fur or the feathers. So again, you can see the, the, the tortured landscape and uh, just how sensational it is. The colours, I uh, couldn't tell you whether they're real or not, but they, there are lots and lots of really different colours up there. So they're probably quite close. Um, they're possibly a little bit enhanced, a little bit stronger. I don't mind pushing the... Uh, color saturation a little bit to the right um, and you know, boosting it up because, um, well, our raw files aren't necessarily as colorful as I remember them. This I love to start uh, just where, obviously there've been big blocks of ice and they just melted away bit by bit and left these depressions. Then the snows come through us and uh, snows collected and then the rest of the snow is melted away. Just fascinating patterns that you see. Um, bit hard, I think, to share this photograph on a small screen but up as a big one metre square print, it just really looks beautiful. Shapes and patterns. A lot of the photos I take from the air are looking more or less straight down. I like the plan view. I like to remove the horizon so that you take away the context of the location. And that way you can just you know, concentrate on the, the patterns. I mean, this reminds me of an Yves Tango painting, uh, just, just the way that the shapes all move through there and just a little bit of colour here and there perhaps a little bit more um, realistic in uh, realism where you can see that it's you know, a, a, a or I guess a little lagoon um, and it will fill up I guess uh, later on in, uh, in summer when the, the melt happens I'm guessing. And this, uh, this particular occasion we are just finishing our flight and uh, the pilot had just taken us over and uh, the, uh, just a, another glacier just on the way back and he said, okay, we've got to go now. And as we turned around, I'm looking at this. And I said, oh, have we got another few minutes? He said, no, we've got to take the next group. We've got to go. And so I just had time to shoot this and, and this. And these are through the front of the helicopter glass. So, you know, we take the top, we take the door off or we shoot through a, a window so that uh, one, or, one way or another, because it's best to shoot from the air with an unobstructed view. But these two shots, they are as, tack as uh, you know, sharp as attack 
and they was just shot through uh, the, the, the glass bubble in the front of the, uh, the helicopter. So uh, yeah, just, just wonderful textures and patterns. Absolutely scrummy. So uh, on the way back, the uh, little views, just the little hamlets, I guess, just floating around. And it's just, again, another shot that's on the road, not necessarily one of the hero locations. This is up to, uh, towards Upper Salem. Again, I've probably pronounced that incorrectly, but on the other side is the uh, Diamond Beach, the Black Beach where the icebergs come up. I've probably got a couple of shots there. And that's certainly a, um, a crowd pleaser. One of our um, guides, we, we had a guide that took us, uh, a local guide who took us to a, um, an ice cave later on. And he said that this beach, I forgot a shot, here we go, this beach here gets 4 million visitors now, was it two million? Does it really matter? Two million or four million visitors a year. I mean, when we were there, the buses would turn up and, you know, disgorge 50 tourists and they'd all walk down and, you know, they'd be on the beach. The beauty is, all you had to do was walk two or three hundred metres up the beach and there's hardly anybody there. Just a few other photographers like you looking, looking for shots that were a little bit different. You can go to this beach and there will be not, there will be no ice on it at all. I have been there once where we saw one or two small little pieces of ice, like the little one in the middle, and that was it. And then on this particular occasion, there's just so much ice. So it depends on the glacier activity. The lake behind the beach, um, there, are, there are glaciers that come down and carve into it. And then gradually those um, iceberg bits go out through a channel out to the sea. And then the waves hit the icebergs and throw them back up onto the beach and they all get broken up. So it's all dependent on uh, the weather, but it seems to me that it's not so seasonally dependent. It just depends on what else has been happening, the direction of the wind and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we, we were there one morning, not an iceberg. We came back later, later in the afternoon and there are, there are heaps. On this particular occasion, when we were there for a couple of days, <laughs> there was no shortage of ice whatsoever. Uh, it's one of the ice caves. Don't know whether I quite nailed the ice cave. We had very um, murky weather and uh, I think that's just an opportunity to go back and shoot it again. So I'm just going to stop the share and have a look at on the side to make sure uh, I'll just have a look at a couple of the quick questions and then I've got a few other photos to uh, to take us on with and I'm just seeing there what time of day were the aerial shot they were done in the middle of the day, um, middle, middle issue of the day so I guess the, um, I'm guessing a little bit but from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock roughly. Um, I it's funny, when you shoot, from, you know, a couple of friends of mine and I, we do quite a bit of aerials, and there's an argument. When you shoot in the middle of the day um, and you're shooting water, then you're more likely to get the colour from the water to come back up and out. But maybe when you shoot at the ends of the day, what you have is some really nice long shadows. And so I don't actually have a preference. I used to prefer the early or the late because of the shadows, but now if I'm looking for colour, and when we're looking for abstracts, really doesn't matter what time of the day it is. And also, if you're shooting mountains, then very often doesn't really matter where the sun is. You can find sight lighting in all sorts of different places. So I'm quite open to what time of the day I go. Uh, on this occasion, we had a little bit of a, uh, an opportunity in the middle of the day where the weather forecast wasn't too good either side. So you take what you can get. Um, so love the luminance of the, okay, the phase one. Can you get that detail in full frame? I reckon you can get the detail um, in more or less, well, okay, let me free, rephrase that. The luminosity comes in the way that we process the file. So it's, if you've got a good quality raw file that you've, you've basically, you've, um, you're not clipping, so, and you have, it's plenty of, you've got your exposure right, you've got your focus right, then it's just a matter of how you process that file that can give it that luminosity. And so I shoot a lot these days with a little Fuji camera, and you know, when I put my Fuji photos up alongside my face photos and they're on say Instagram or something like that, I don't get people saying, oh, that was shot in the Fuji and that was shot on the phase. If you want to make a big print, um, then the phase certainly comes into its own. Phase has also got a much greater dynamic range. And so I guess the answer is that it is easier for me to create images with that luminosity than it is with other cameras, but it is not impossible. So why do I use the phase? Because it does give me that extra image quality. Is it essential? No. If you are shooting on Canon or Nikon, go and grab yourself some Zeiss glass. Because I've used Zeiss on a Nikon D800, and I can remember flipping through my files, I was shooting the phase and the, um, the Nikon, 
And as I flipped through, normally I could see the shots taken on the Nikon, the Nikon glass, and you could just tell the difference. But I realized that I'd shot these on those ice, and I reckon it's a step towards medium format. It's not medium format, but your bank balance will love you a lot more. Okay, let's see if I can bring up another series of pictures, and we'll just roll through these ones uh, reasonably quickly so that we've got time, and back into there. I've got them set up here, slideshow, sort by date created, and you see all my dirty washing here, so we better take that off quickly. There we go. <clears throat> so an example of a um, shooting on a rainy day, where when I asked for the, the, the bus to be stopped, this is on a phase one PODAS, my first time to um, uh, Iceland, I was with uh, Kevin Raber and um, uh, Drew Altdorfer, and it was raining and overcast. I said, stop, stop. And they said, oh, well, you're right. you know, there's nothing there. And so this is what I photographed. And the raw file was very, very plain. But then knowing what's there and knowing what you can do with a file, and I guess that's one of the, the things I try to help people with when they come on a Better Moments workshop, is yes, getting to you to the locations is great. Having a good time, you'll love my jokes. Uh, I've, uh, I have a great series of um, dad jokes. I'm looking for new people to, uh, to uh, exercise them on. Uh, but I think it's also, you know, I, I try to show people what I have processed. So each morning I'll come down with a few photos that I've processed quickly. They're, they're just a, a rough process run in Capture One or Lightroom, I process them quickly, and people go, oh, wow, and um, well, sometimes they go, oh, that's that all you did, Pete? But occasionally they say, oh, wow, but it just gives you an idea. So they've been to the location and they've seen what I've done, and I feel that that sometimes, you know, going on a workshop with you know, someone who sees like me, if you like the way that I shoot, then come along on a workshop because I can certainly help you understand that way. It's not going to be instantaneous, but bit by bit, you'll certainly be able to develop your style and create shots. Now, having said all of that, I want you to just take a deep breath and put up with me, because it was very rainy on this trip to Iceland, and we couldn't get out of the truck for two days, and I got a bit desperate, and so I started shooting photos through the window. And I thought, well, these are actually quite moody shots. So they're long shots, they're blurred, all shot with a phase one, you know, medium format. Look at that resolution, isn't that fantastic? You're, su you're supposed to be laughing at that. But it made, made, a, made a series of shots which I quite enjoyed doing. Anyway, I, um, it, it, it did stop raining and we got out and that took a, a few photos. Another shot of the, the Church of Budia, another different angle there. Uh, just up the road, some of the, the moss of water coming through. Uh, the views so are volcano. Volcano is absolutely everywhere. Um, so Jarlan's Foss, very famous um, waterfall. It's one of uh, three that you probably go to. Bull Foss, so Jarlan's Foss, and the other one will come to me, but I think I've got a photo of it coming up. Or maybe not. It's funny, it's probably the most famous, the really big one. What's it called? come to me um, and uh, it's uh, everybody shoots it. You can't not get a good shot of it, but I don't know whether I've left one in here. Oh, this, is, this is a close view of it. But it's just fantastic, the, the volume of water coming over. And you look at these and you think, oh, wow, you know, where are they? The reality is that you drive up and there's a car park, you walk across some, you know, sort of like a football field and there you are and there are these amazing photos. Not every location in Iceland is that easy, but in terms of access, you can get fantastic shots um, just off the side of the road. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I really do find that you know, when I'm traveling through Iceland, yes, these hero locations are great to get to, but it's stopping along the way that is you know, where I think I get my favorite shots at any rate. Oh, here it is, this is it. Now, I can't remember the name of it, so someone will tell me. So I have got one in here, but yeah, fantastic. Uh, just, just being there, every time I go there, I take the same photograph. Um, I try to do it differently, I never do but I enjoy the process. It's just, yeah, just a sensational spot. Back up in, uh, um, up in Yokosalon, up in the, uh, we, we did a uh, Zodiac cruise there and up amongst the uh, icebergs. Um, I took a little walk one day and uh, tried to convince a few uh, photographers to come for a walk with me. We were staying out overnight because um, it was never really going, the sun was, while the sun set, it never got completely dark and we're expecting it to come up at uh, about two o'clock. As it turned out, we had a fog that came in that changed that. But this walk was just a wonderful evening and I got down to the far end, which is about two kilometres down the road, 
and this was the photo I got. It didn't quite look like that. Um, this is another shot taken, um, you know, so it's the same icebergs, but just from a different angle. I had a whole lot with the moon and with the reflection, and I ended up shooting it without the moon because I felt that it was a bit distracting. I thought there was enough light there. Anyway, I showed everybody the photo that I took. No one had come with me, and I was lonely, no friends, all on my lonesome down there. And we went back a couple of nights, and everybody wanted to come down and uh, see where I'd taken it. And unfortunately, the wind had changed and there weren't any icebergs. So the moral of the story is go today, shoot it today, because you never know what's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, another fantastic little uh, scar scar force, something like that, um, all on that side. You might look at that for a little while. You can see a few people just up here on the top left, just to give it a bit of scale. So again, the access that you get to, to take these sort of scenes is just sensational. Um, and I'm really just doing it as a, a simple tourist, you know, shooting from a car. Um, there are opportunities to get on the big four-wheel drives, to go out to the centre of the island. Um, there are all sorts of, you know, so, you know, even if you come on a photo trip with me, think about hanging around or getting there early and doing another side trip or you know, getting a few of the local Icelanders as well to take you out just to get to the locations because it's, you know, you, you could, I, I could spend six months in Iceland and, and not get bored. Just fantastic location. So some close-ups of the ice. Um, this is the um, beach, very famous. So I'm sure you recognise it. Around from Vic, a couple of yeah, a couple of stacks on the end there. Low exposure, a little bit of post-production. Just the texture in the rock I loved. Another, it was a clear day at Gullfoss. You can see the. Uh, the water pluming up. You see, these are people on the uh, uh, lookout at the, up the top, and that's that's the final shot that I did from on that particular day. So you know, the sun's just up hot. Yeah, it's just above the horizon, but uh, bluebird day, and um, yeah, it was challenging to get something interesting, but I was happy. This I love. I mean, an Australian, I guess we have eaves, etc., and it's over in Iceland. They don't have much in the way of eaves, and the architecture is colourful and I. Oh, you know, almost like a Jeffrey Smart painting, I guess, a little bit. And I just love the architecture and walking around the towns, uh, just, just shooting things. So again, it's not just the weather, it's absolutely everything that's there. Uh, this is one of the uh, days that wasn't quite so windy. That's a joke. <laughs> uh, the waterfall, the water didn't actually get all the way down to the bottom before it got picked up and blown over the other side. Sensational. Uh, earlier shot with the Hilnar Church. Uh, this is a one I like. It's yeah, almost like the, the models, again, the architecture, position of the church in that position. Um, you know, we, you know, we try and give everybody a little bit of time off, and we had an afternoon off, and we're staying down at the hotel. And I just remembered seeing this photo as we drive, we drove in and wandered back, and uh, it's two shots stitched together. Didn't quite have a wide enough lens with me, so I just took three shots and stitched them together. Uh, made, made sure they're all rectilinear with a little bit of... Um, uh, aspect ratio and uh, perspective control. I couldn't make the sides of this one vertical because they weren't. That was another joke. I hope you get my uh, humour. It's as good as it gets. Long exposure. Again, another shot. It's, it's a, a little book. Just I should have brought it. Um, uh, someone's written a book on where to photograph in Iceland and uh, they needed a They'd sort of seen this photo on my website and asked if they could include it. And I've now got a copy of the book. So when I go back, I'll be there with Christian. I'll be able to open up the book and tell him exactly where to go because I'm going to have a book all about it. So I'm looking forward to that. This is out in uh, Land, Land, uh, Land Manalagur. Man, 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 yeah, it's out that way. Land Manalagur, Lagar, anyway, something like that. And again, we didn't get there last trip, but the trip before we did. Weather dependent, just depends on the time of year. But you can see all of the green covering the black, the volcanic black. It's just a really different sort of landscape. Very, very uh, strong. Telephoto lens here just to uh, isolate, just concentrate on color. Use of contrast in uh, both a capture one or Lightroom will bring that right up. Oh, that's a straight shot. There's a little bit of a difference there. You can see I left that in. Uh, another couple of examples, long exposures, the stack. I'm up the top. Now, this is another aerial when there's a little bit more water again. So if there's more water, you're more likely to get the river deltas working. Whereas the time that we were last year, wasn't as much water running because uh, it had gone a bit cold and we'd had the early snow. So that was great because there was snow over the, um, the waterfalls and things like that. But it also meant that there was less water running through and so we didn't quite get 
the, the shapes and patterns that we might have otherwise got over the Dilbert. But it's different. So was I unhappy this year? Hell no, I got some fantastic stuff. It's just different. Uh, one of the little green volcanoes from uh, there's a, a, a trip which we did uh, on a plane, uh, which gave us a little bit more range. And this is over to this uh, Lands Around the Dua area. Fantastic view, yeah, just, just blows me away. Uh, just, yeah, again, I have left the horizon in there. I've squished the image just a little bit just to uh, create it, but the light, the, uh, the light was just fantastic. Comes and goes. Not all of that trip was fantastic in terms of the light, but uh, that's a long story, which I'll tell you on our next trip if you come along. Haircut, that's certainly not my, my style, I'm afraid, I wish. Uh, back up the, uh, back up towards uh, Yonkos Island. This is another little lake which is less travelled to, uh, a lot quieter. And I've just got a couple of photos here which we've just got to whiz through. Just, oh, that, that was it, beg your pardon. I'll go back to that, that's right. Um, no, that, that, that was it, that was it. All righty, let me just stop the share. Came up a little bit quicker than I was expecting. I'm just having a little bit, oh, please slow down when scrolling, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, okay, with the delay to going up for 30 seconds. I'm sorry about that. I can go back and go through a few, but I'm supposed to be taking questions and answers at the moment. Scoba Foss for someone, thank you, Robin, that's fantastic. Um, and Svati Foss as well was the other one, that's right, that was the smaller one. And Suzanne's laughing at my jokes still, that's great. Land Manor La Girl, thank you, Simone, that's correct. Please slow down, I did go a little bit quickly, sorry about that, Peter. And how often do I use filters and the best time to use them? With post-production, I probably don't use filters much at all. Sometimes I'll use an ND filter because that allows me to have a long exposure. Very rarely I'll use a polarizing filter because that may allow me to, well, allows me to look underneath the water, obviously, to you know, reduce the specular highlights. Sometimes if I'm photographing in the rainforest or a, a, um, the forest, etc. You know, notice the sheen that you'll get on the leaves. You know, certain leaves are very shiny. And sometimes that specular can be a problem, not the highlight. By using a polarizing filter, I can get rid of that highlight. But you have to be careful how far you use it, because sometimes you can completely get rid of those specular highlights, and then you, you're looking at it and there's no shape to the trees at all. So it, you, you have to be careful how you use it. But they're probably the only filters that I use these days. Some people use graduated neutral density filters, and um, interesting, a couple of my friends used to recommend them. Funnily enough, they seem to be using them less now. The main problem is that when you use the graduated neutral density filters, it's got a straight line. And some of the landscapes in Iceland have got straight lines, but others have got mountains. So what happens? Where do you position it? And so I find that if I want to darken down the sky, I'm probably better off taking two photos and you know, just you know, joining them together with a mask that I do in Photoshop or in uh, Capture One, etc. Can't do multiple exposures in Capture One, uh, so it would be in Photoshop that I'm doing that. Um, and so the best time to use them is for me, the graduated, sorry, the neutral density filters. I'm using a 10 stop very often, or 15 stop, 10 stop, and six stop. So if you buy an ND filter, don't get the 0 0.3, 0 0.6, or 0.9, which is one, two, or three stops, if you want to do the sort of long exposure work I'm doing in the middle of the day. You need to get a six stop, a 10 stop, or a 15 stop because they are going to allow you, even though it's the middle of the day, with an ISO of say 100, aperture of f11, f16, they will allow you to do a 30 second or two minute exposure. Um, I use Nissi filters um, because I find them very neutral. Um, sometimes when you add a neutral density filter and it's on there for a long period of time, you end up with a bit of a color cast. I still do get a little bit of a color cast with the 15 stop, but the 10 stop I find incredibly neutral. And again, when I'm doing post-production, I can use my white balance, just click on the neutral tone. The problem basically goes away anyway. Okay, uh, any, uh, Laura, any other questions yeah. there? Uh, there was another question from Linda who asked, what do you re recommend for aerials, the helicopter or the plane? Well, when we were there last time, we couldn't actually get the plane. Uh, we had to go for the helicopter. I actually, hmm, we, we do, uh, I do another workshop in New Zealand where we have both a helicopter and a plane. And, you know, the helicopter is fantastic because you can get into, you know, the, in between the mountains, etc. But the plane gives us more range because it's a bit quicker and it's also a bit cheaper. Uh, certainly, we find that the helicopter can be three, four, five times more expensive than hiring a plane for the same time. Uh, but it just depends what's available. 
when we went last time, we looked to get a, get a plane, but we were unable to orchestrate things so that the plane was ready when we were ready, etc. Uh, but that would have given a small range. We could have gone a little bit further than we did with the helicopter. In terms of the photos that we get out, out of the plane or either, I, I don't have a preference. Um, I get great shots out of both, so I don't find it a negative. I do find it important though that you have the doors off or a window. We did some fl flights over um, Utah in the States recently uh, in winter, and the pilots were a little bit concerned about it, but they took the whole door off and we were um, uh, built it up, etc. and it wasn't too cold. You just wear your, your warm weather gear and, and everything's fine. But being able to shoot out without anything impeded, so you just look, shooting straight out, just means that you can turn around. Whereas if you're shooting through a little hole in a window, you can do it, but it's just not quite as convenient. But I, from memory, when we went in um, Iceland, a pilot wouldn't take the uh, windows off, but we did have enough access with the, uh, the little windows that we had. Mm -hmm. But as long as you're not shooting through the glass, that's the most important thing. Yeah. There were a few more questions about aerials. Um, what lens do you use from for aerial images, asks Timothy? Yeah, so I'm normally using a uh, an 80 mil or a 50 mil. So a 50 mil on a full frame DSLR. So it's a standard lens, uh, no magnification. When you need to get a wider shot, you tell the pilot to go up higher. When you need to get a closer shot, you tell the pilot to get down a little bit closer. Of course, as you come down closer, um, if you're in a plane, the land is going past you faster and so you might need to have a faster show speed. These days I recommend shooting with a one two thousandth of a second as a minimum. That's what I'm always aiming at. Now I've got super sharp photos taken at a one one twenty fifth of a second when I'm going around in a circle in a plane and I just happen to get it right and I've got one shot there but I've probably taken 20 and the other 19 are all blurred. So the simple approach is go for a fast shutter speed maybe push your ISO up. Most of the cameras these days can shoot at ISO 400, 800, and you don't even know. There's no noise, no nothing to worry about. So you just push your ISO up, shoot at 2,000 per second, and um, yeah, your, your shots are then nice and sharp. Um, <clears throat> so did I answer that question? I saw there's another one, can you open the doors <laughs> on both sides? Yes, yes, both sides are that. You've got to watch though that on, in a helicopter that the pilot doesn't leave his door open because often there'll be four doors and the pilot leaves his on. And what you get is a Venturi effect where the person who's sitting behind the pilot gets blown away because all the wind is coming through a narrow opening. So whenever we do that, we tell the pilot not to be lazy, to go and get his own jacket and to freeze like the rest of us because you want to have them all off. That works fine. Um, so I'm just having a look. Uh, notice the way you made square images in your aer aerials. Why? Um, it's interesting, isn't it? Square used to be arty. Panorama, you know, like the 617 or the Ken Duncan panoramas, they used to be arty for a while. And then they started to become you know, associated, I guess, more with the, the landscape, with the reality. Verticals are sort of more portraiture, etc. Whereas the square seemed to be a ratio that worked in the art world where because it was square, it wasn't making a statement one way or the other. And then Apple came out and started to put all of its photos into a square grid and all of a sudden square becomes very, very common and popular. And so I'm not quite too sure whether I love square frames as much or not these days, but I do find that um, square aerials, or we call them these days square aerials, the abstract aerials, they just seem to work. Um, I, I, I can't be more precise than that. I, I, yeah, some people like them, some people don't, but I do find the square aerial works very, very well. Very, very popular in photo competitions these days mm -hmm. uh, in that, and a lot of people put in some fantastic square aerial shots and they go, oh, look at that, and it is great. Unfortunately, 50 other people have put in similar photos, um, which are also great. And so I guess the common denominator uh, comes down a little bit. And because they are so popular now, it, you really have to take a great um, square aerial, a great aerial to get a, a high score in a, a photo competition these days. Um, okay. Here's my Arca Swiss Cube with my Stable, yep, yep. Oh, it's privately, okay. Uh, yep, okay, did you mention what aperture in here is? Okay, so aperture, I'm normally shooting, okay, so I've got f2.8 lenses, and I'm normally shooting at f4 if I can, but sometimes it's f2.8, and sometimes I might get it to f5.6 if I'm lucky, depending on what I'm photographing. When you're going over snow, there's on, on, on glaciers, there's a lot of light being reflected, 
I can sometimes get up to F8 at ISO 50 and 2000% because there's so much light. If I'm going up early in the morning or late in the afternoon, when the sun is coming through a lot of atmosphere, it's just clipping the tops of the, of the, the landscape, then I need more light. And so I might end up shooting at F2.8. So I've developed certain approaches where certainly the lenses I'm using, it's a, a Schneider uh, 2.8, uh, 80 mil lens or 50 mil lens. So it is sharp at F2.8. It's not as sharp as it could be in the corners, not as sharp as it would be at F8, but it's sharp enough. And then in Capture One, there's the, um, in the lens section, not the normal sharpening section, but there's uh, another little section, I forget what it's called now, but it's basically using a deep, deconvolution sharpening approach where you just move that slider and it's the sharp in the edges I think it is and that sharpens things up really really nicely so it's a uh, just a, a little trick for aerials that if you have shots and that doesn't just apply the face files it's to any files um, when you're shooting with DSLRs you often find that the corners aren't as sharp now if you're making a photograph and you want it to be up big you want it to be sharp in the middle, that's where you start, but then as you go out to the corners, you'll find that the corners often fall off. That's because, you know, lenses are round and they project an image which is circular, spherical, and so, but they're pushing it onto a completely flat sensor. And so the edges, you know, where, where do you focus? There is depth of focus to a certain extent, just which works like depth of field, but when you're shooting at f2.8, the corners can be a little bit blurred. And so that's, we go back to Ravon's comment, that's another reason why if you crop into a square, you don't have to worry about the corners mm -hmm. of your file so much, and so you don't have those less than sharp bits in the corner. Um, so, so yeah, so I, I try to shoot f4, it just gives me a little bit more depth of focus as opposed mm -hmm. to depth of field. Um, when I'm up there focusing, I actually lock my phase camera off onto infinity focus. When you, with, with medium format, well, with the phase autofocus, when you're moving along at speed, it's focusing on all sorts of stuff down the bottom and you know it looks sharp to us but to a sensor it's a little bit of a blur and sometimes it'll say it's focused but it's not the photos are definitely not focused so what i do before i go up is the phase xf has got a hyperfocal focusing point where i can preset it so i can just press a button and it will focus on infinity it's not using autofocus to focus on infinity i've worked out how many rotations of the autofocus motor it takes to get precise focus. Now, yeah, phase does all of this. I haven't done this, but it, it, you can do it automatically on your, uh, easily on your camera. So then when I'm up in the air, if I'm, um, you know, 500 or 1,000 feet or higher, I just press that button and I know I've focused on infinity, my photo's sharp. Um, if we're going to photograph um, coming a little bit closer to some mountains, etc., well, then I might need to flip back to ordinary autofocus and um, shoot there. And if you are focusing, if you're going to use autofocus on a DSLR, then what I suggest you do is to look out the horizon and focus on something that's not moving. And then you can leave the, you're happy, you know, basically if you use back button focus, you can hold the focus and then you can point down and continue shooting. So focus can be an issue, but I find with DSLRs, generally they don't struggle the way that the phase, file, phase camera struggles up in the air. Um, the quality that you get out of the phase files is fantastic. The quality you get out of your DSLR is pretty damn good as well. So I'm not a camera snob. You you get great great shots uh, from the air with your DSLR and mirrorless cameras as well. Mm -hmm. um, shutter priority. I'm normally in aperture priority, um, and I also use auto ISO. Um, so I only use my ISO up to 800 on the phase, so it's not moving too much. Uh, but shutter priority is fine. Put it on 2,000 per second. Add in auto ISO. Uh, if you, the reason that I don't go on shutter priority is because if I can shoot at an aperture smaller than f4, I'll dial it down to f5.6 because just so I know my corners are going to be better. Um, and that's why I like to stay in aperture priority. But shutter priority that does the job as well. Yeah. Uh, one question from my side, like what basic equipment would you recommend everyone to have who wants to go to Iceland for landscape photography? So your longest lens and your shortest lens and everything in between, I guess. Um, don't worry about paying excess luggage to get all your gear there because there's so much that happens. Having, having said that, uh, you know, if I'm talking, say, um, a DSLR, full frame DSLR, I have a Canon 11 to 24 mil, so it's really wide to not so wide. So 16 to 35, something along those lines, I think is essential because you've all seen a few of my photos using that wide angle to mm. good effect. And then I love using 300 and 600 mil lenses 
as well. So that's the one thing I don't have with uh, the phase is the longest I can really go is 150 mil at the moment. I'm working on an alternative there, but I, I don't, I'll tell you about that another time. But with my DSLRs, I can shoot with a 300 mil, 400 mil, 600 mil. And I, you know, in Iceland, there are lots of landscapes way in the distance where mm -hmm. you can just, you know, dip different mountain ranges, etc. It just all comes together, all those little churches, those buildings. So telephoto is really important. Then you've got the 24 to 70 or the 24 to 105 in the middle. Yeah, you might as well bring that along because that's what you'll take all of the memory shots for, for as well. So, yeah, really just your widest, your longest, and just a middle wing of the road. Free lenses will probably do you. You'll be happy. But if you've got a few extra, bring them along. I always do. Tripod, very important if you're going to do landscape. Um, and, and bring some filters because mm -hmm. the uh, the ND filters really do when, when you blur that water and blur the clouds. I mean, Iceland's got great clouds, great opportunities. You have know, waterfalls, fantastic location for shooting moving water. Mm -hmm. And what is your your favorite location in Ireland? We saw so many photos from so many different places. I don't I don't have favorite locations. I don't have favorite places in the world. It's the next place I go to. Everywhere is wonderful, but it just depends what's happening. Um, I guess I would be disappointed not to go to a lot of the places that we've been to before when I go back, but then there are so many other places yet to see. Uh, and I think that's, you know, sometimes people go on these trips with a real desire to get a particular photo, etc. And I, I sort of take a slightly different view because often I've been on, maybe I just don't want to uh, disappoint myself, but I've been on, um, on trips where I've wanted to get something and everything's conspired against me, it just hasn't happened. But then I walked around the corner and there was something I didn't know about, didn't think about, and it was even better. And so mm -hmm. I have a more of a deterministic view of life now is that I just turn up, go with the flow, and just be open to uh, things that happen. It seems to me that most days you get one or two great opportunities. I remember in Iceland, the last trip, we're driving back from somewhere, I forget where it was, and I thought, oh, geez, we haven't really got much today. I hope everyone's not going to be disappointed. And we come around the corner and the light just you know, went off. There's a lake there. It was just the most, you know, we, we, we spent an hour shooting something fantastic. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of sitting back and going with the flow. And yeah, there'll be a couple of days where nothing much happens, but those other days make up for it in spades. And how many photos do you usually need to take until you have a keeper? <laughs> well, I can't, I, well, I, was, I suppose in Iceland, I would have taken five or 6,000 shots and I might have um, processed 50 of those I was happy mm -hmm. with. But if I get to a location and I'm, you know, it, it's interesting, I, I, I might take 200 photos of very similar angle just as I'm exploring. Mm -hmm. I also take a couple of shots wider. But sometimes I find they get back and I think, oh, I've just cropped that a little bit too tightly. So these days I almost force myself to take a few steps back and just take the wider shot as well, just so that I've got that opportunity to, to crop. And we've got so many sense of, you know, so many pixels on all of our cameras these days that cropping is no longer a taboo thing. It's something that we we can all do if we want to. Yeah. And if you go to a location for the first time, have you done any research before how you want to take your, your photo, how you want to frame it, or is it more spontaneous? Um, it's a big question that people ask about travel. Do you research and understand what you're likely to see? In which case, when you react, how are you reacting? Or do you just go there and not know anything? And when you get there, you're, you're blown away and it's all completely fresh. And I don't think there's a right answer to that. Uh, I think it's different for different people on different uh, occasions. I've certainly been to places where I've been really well prepared, or I've been back and I know what's happening. And I've probably got better shots because I knew what was happening. On the other hand, I reckon every trip I go away, I'm coming back with photos where we just stop by the side of the road, nothing planned and just something happens because you're out there and you're, you're waiting for it, you're ready for it. And um, so I think you've got to be open to both, of, both approaches. Before I went to Iceland, I would do some research. I'd look at all of the locations, all you know, get heaps of stuff on Instagram, on uh, Google, etc. get some books, find some of the photographers who uh, have shot a lot of Iceland, look at their work, etc., And then you've got a feeling for what's there. I think that's a good idea. But then when you come and you say, oh, I really want to photo photograph Gullfoss when there's lots of snow around and there's no snow around, mm -hmm. you need to have a plan B that says, all right, well, I can't photograph with lots of snow around. If I remember this guy who did it really well without the snow around and he did it this way. So I think that there's different ways that you can approach the same subject. So I think, yeah, don't be disappointed. Just yeah, 
right? It's not a glass half empty, it's still mm -hmm. a glass half full. Okay. Well, there are no more questions and we're also out of time, so... Okay, oh good. <laughs> oh, I can see quite a few people there from, uh, you know, I can recognize quite a few names. So thank That's you for great. everybody for coming along and saying hello. It was very kind. Yeah, thanks for sharing your work with us and your dad jokes, of course. And oh, I, I, can, I, can I do one quick little thing though? I almost yeah. forgot. I just got to share one more little screen. And just for everybody there, so I've got, I, I'm going to try and collect a few email addresses if I could, but I've got something in return. So I've got a whole lot of in, um, photo tips. Now, some of the photographers who've been away with me on workshops before will already have this information in a book that I've given them, etc. But So what I've done is I've created a series of photography tip magazines, and all you have to do is go to Better Photography. Now, that's not Better Moments, because I don't know where Christian got the name for his business, but it's a very, very good name that he's got, <laughs> Better Moments. And my magazine is betterphotography.com slash moments. And there is a screen there where basically you fill in your name and email address, and then it'll give you a link where you can download invisible editing. And then over the next few days, it will send you uh, the uh, two or three more books. And then there's also going to be an offer to subscribe to Better Photography magazine. But there's no obligation. The, uh, the, the books are there for yours. And this is brand new for me. So if it doesn't work, go easy on me. Just let me know. But at the moment, I've just set it up and I'm testing it out. So fingers crossed it works. I don't want to look too amateurous, but you know, you know how we go. Yeah. I think that's cool. it. Yeah. So thanks again. And my apologies again to everyone who had trouble joining in the beginning. Um, like we mentioned in the beginning, Peter will run a workshop in Iceland this year. So if you also wanted to take such incredible aerials and photos of glaciers and volcanoes, then check our website for more information about the trip. For those of you who joined us later, uh, we offer a free single room upgrade and a free city walk to everyone who signs up for the workshop before August. And as the workshop is hosted in cooperation with Phase One, you will be provided with a Phase One camera system worth 60,000 euro, uh, dollar, sorry. And keep in mind you that you- have to give it back. Yeah, you have to give it back, unfortunately, <laughs> but you, you get to play <laughs> with it for a while. <laughs> we count them in the end. <laughs> um, yeah, and since it's still Corona times, keep in mind that you will receive a full refund on the workshop price if we have to cancel the workshop due to Corona. And yeah, that's it. We will send out a link to the recording in the next couple of days. So those of you who joined later can, can watch the beginning afterwards. And we will also have a few more webinars with Better Moments experts in the next couple of months. So if you sign up for a newsletter, you will be informed about them. So that's it for today or tonight, depending where you are. Thanks so much for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day and we hope to see you again for our next webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. See you.